we also have learning goals. Sort of a shame that I didn't start this new uh, uh, studying for becoming a teacher before I made all of the presentations for the subsea parts. I don't, I don't have time to go back and fix all of them, but if I was doing them as we go along, then it would be a bit easier than I could do this for those also. So today we're going to become familiar with something called viscosity limits. So we looked at viscosity uh, last week. And we're going to become familiar with viscosity pressure ratios. So basically how the viscosity changes with increased pressure. And we're going to become familiar with the drive of a hydraulic power supply. So that's the HPU that we were uh, talking about in the uh, uh, subsea technology uh, yesterday, hydraulic power supply unit, so HPU. We're going to become familiar with the pump of a hydraulic power supply, and that's uh, basically it. We won't be done with the pump today, so we will continue with that uh, on the next one, I think. So within uh, talking about pumps, we are going to become familiar with something called displacement volume, so we're going to look at that. And we are going to be able to calculate the flow from displacement volume and rotational speed. So if we, if we know the displacement volume and the rotational speed of the pump, then we're going to be able to calculate the flow. And we're going to become familiar with operating pressure, input speed, efficiency, and characteristic pump curves. So that's all to do with the pump, and still we're not done with the pump uh, with it. So we're going to be able to calculate efficiency using the characteristic pump curves. And then we still have more pump to do next lecture. So we'll start off with the viscosity and limits. So the excessively low viscosity will lead to increased leakage. So that's when, when uh, if our if our hydraulic fluid becomes more and more similar to water and flows very, very uh, easily, then there is uh, a higher chance of there being a leakage because there is a higher chance that it will basically just float around whatever it is sealing it inside our system. And also we don't have that uh, good of a lubrication for it, so it won't lubricate as well. <coughs> and uh, even though these are problems with low viscosity, we still want low viscosity in our oil. We just don't want the excessively low one. We don't want it to be really, really low. But we want it to be, be low because uh, the lower viscosity we have, the less uh, internal friction there will be inside the fluid flow. So that we will, we will uh, sort of have to use less power in order to move this around and uh, make it flow. But uh, as we looked at uh, yesterday, uh, no, not yesterday, but on Friday, uh, the viscosity changes with temperatures and stuff. So sometimes you will have to use a thicker fluid because the operating temperature of the equipment will be a lot higher. So then the viscosity will change and it will become uh, flow better uh, when, when it's at its operating temperature. But it will be too thick basically in the start. shouldn't be that thick, but there is no way around it. You have to, uh, either then you would have to preheat the hydraulic fluid uh, before you start the equipment, which is a possibility uh, and could be done if, if, there was, uh, uh, if there was any chance of, of there being uh, extra wear and tear on uh, very, very expensive equipment. Uh, it might be possible to just heat the, the hydraulic fluid beforehand, just to keep a, get it up to the operating temperature so that it would uh, flow correctly. But mostly, like in a car engine, you start from cold. So, uh, so it's a cold engine, and then uh, uh, the engine heats the oil as it, as it gains its operating uh, temperature. Also, high viscosity is uh, not that good. I've already mentioned it. We get more friction inside the, uh, the fluid flow, and uh, this will lead to pressure drops. And of course, with increased friction, uh, you get uh, an increased warming, so you will generate more heat inside the fluid. And then one of the, uh, one of the uh, properties of a hydraulic fluid is sort of lost because uh, the hydraulic fluid is also supposed to be cooling the system as it is moving along. And, uh, but 
if the viscosity is too high and the uh, friction is heating up the hydraulic fluid, then you won't have as good of a cooling in it. And of course, then if you, if you end up getting pressure drops because you have high viscosity, you can end up getting cavitation. And we looked at that uh, on Friday and we saw that cavitation, that's not good. That's going to destroy your equip equipment if you get cavitation inside it, especially cavitation over time. If you every now and then get a little bit of cavitation inside your equipment, it's going to handle it fairly fine. Uh, you might have to, you might have to uh, ex uh, ramp up the, the service intervals uh, of the unit so that you, you make sure that you check them a bit more often if there uh, is, if you, you know that there is cavitation happening every now and then inside the system. The problem is when you get cavitation ha ha happening more or less frequently or all the time, that's when you're going to get these really, really heavy wear and tear on the equipment and, and basically just destroying it after a while. <coughs> so we're going to look a bit at uh, kinematic viscosity ranges. So we have a, a uh, lower limit. Just want to flip this one over. So we would like to be within 10 square millimeters per second be ab uh, above 10 square millimeters per second. That's, uh, that's a nice, nice place to be in the kinematic viscosity, fairly close uh, to the lower limit, but, but uh, still above it. So ideally, we would be from 15 to 100 uh, in the kinematic viscosity. And the upper limit, that's uh, then we're talking 750-ish, then it's really, really syrupy stuff uh, you're looking at. So we're also going to look at the viscosity temperature ratios. And this is the uh, left part of uh, figure 3.2. And here we can see we have temperature, increasing temperature along the x-axis, and we have increasi increasing uh, kinematic viscosity along the y-axis. And as you see, when the temperature is going up, we get a... a a um, sort of uh, if we if, if we stay at 200 bar of pressure, which is this line, the, we can see the kinematic viscosity is decreasing quite rapidly, actually, uh, with increased temperature. And if you think like a, a a car engine, which is often operating at around 90 to 100 degrees Celsius, uh, so 100 isn't isn't good because then you would have your, your cooling liquid, which is mostly water with some, uh, some uh, corrosion inhibitors and stuff. Uh, you, you would uh, risk that starting to, to, uh, to boil inside that. So you want to keep it below 100, preferably, or else you're going to see a lot of steam coming out of your radiator. You don't want that, but, uh, but you, you keep it around uh, between 80 and 100, basically. So, so that's where the... Wh where the um, a petrol or diesel engine works best. And that's one of the problems if you have these uh, outside uh, motors on, uh, on uh, smaller boats, because those are cooled by the seawater. So they get, uh, they get uh, cooling liquid that's around between zero and 20 degrees Celsius. That's directly cooling it. So they, they, uh, they can't operate at the optimum temperature. So they are uh, creating a lot of uh, bad exhaust for the environment because they are uh, operating at a lower temperature so that they don't get the perfect combustion that the, uh, that the uh, car engines do. Car engines don't get perfect combustion uh, anyway, but they get a much cleaner combustion than what uh, an outboard uh, engine on a, on a small boat would get. But as we can see here, for, for an example, at, at 200 bars of pressure, so then we, we start off at a really high viscosity uh, at uh, around 20 degrees. So we're off at uh, 250 uh, in viscosity. And we can go all the way down to around 10 when we get, get up to uh, 100 degrees. So, so there's a lot of change in viscosity here with, with increased heat. And if you think about it, zero, zero to 100 degrees isn't really all that much much when you are starting to, uh, to add heat into a system like this. You, you, can, you can quickly get quite a lot more as you saw in thermodynamics. So um, this is, uh, I if you didn't have cooling systems in your car engines, the, the uh, temperature would skyrocket. It would go 
way about this. <coughs> what we use to sort of classify uh, the different, different hydraulic fluids are viscosity indexes, which are from this ISO standard, 2909. And it basically just means that with increasing temperature, we get decreasing viscosity. And that's what the viscosity index tells us. It tells us sort of the, the, the curve that we will get uh, at a specific, uh, specific pressure. And <coughs> so for the next one, we have a high viscosity index which are the multigrade oils. They can handle very large differences in temperature for, for operating temperatures. And they are mostly used in the mobile hydraulics, like trucks and everything, and anything that's moving around and doing stuff. And low viscosity indexes, those are summer or winter oils. So a, a summer oil with high temperatures would have high viscosity to begin with because it will be heated as you use it. And the winter oil will, will uh, end up with a low viscosity because it's going to be used at colder temperatures. So it needs to start off at a, at a lower viscosity in order to gain the perfect one. <coughs> so here we're uh, looking a bit more at the viscosity pressure ratio. And uh, we're basically looking at pressures above 200 bars, that's where, uh, when you get pressure differences that are greater than 200 bars, that's when you, you start getting uh, changes in your viscosity along, along the lines of the system. So that if you have 250 bars uh, on the pressure side of your system, and then you have uh, just regular atmospheric pressure on the return side going back to the tank, uh, then you would have a pressure difference that is more than 200 bars. So that's when you can end up getting these, uh, uh, these curves uh, which we're seeing here. So basically, if you end up at uh, a uh, pressure uh, difference of 350 to 400 bars, you can basically assume that your, your viscosity is going to be doubled. So that's sort of a rule of thumb that you can, uh, can uh, keep in mind there. So as you see here, we have pressure on the uh, x-axis and our viscosity on the uh, y-axis. And as the pressure increases, we see that the, the viscosity also increases. And it has to do with temperature also here, of course. So we have temperature lines in here. <coughs> and often we are looking at, at, uh, at the 40 degree line. That's uh, often where they, uh, the line they use to set different grades and stuff. So, so they use 40 degrees. But uh, uh, as you can see with the 100 degree, if we get up to, to uh, just, just from zero to 2,000 bars in difference, we, we actually have almost 100 uh, more in uh, kinematic viscosity if we increase the pressure that much. So, so it really does have something to say. Now, just to be on, on the clear side, most hydraulic systems will never gain these kinds of pressures. They won't, won't get up to there, but, but you can easily get up to uh, four or five, 600 bars in a hydraulic system, especially when you're working against uh, against the oil industry and going down into a well and stuff. Then you will get get uh, pretty high uh, high pressures. So uh, especially for the the uh, surface controlled subsurface safety valve, as we've seen, you can often be up to six seven hundred bars of operating pressure on that one. So you do get. You do get quite high pressures, but you usually don't get up to several thousand uh, in, in a regular hydraulic system. We're going to look a bit at uh, different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for here we have uh, different characteristics or properties of, uh, of fluids. So if we, if we have a high density fluid, There is are basically no advantages. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, it's more difficult for the pump to suck it up from the tank because it's so heavy. So that is often why we, we choose oils instead of water-based solutions because oil is, uh, has a lower density than water. Uh, 
so it's easier to, uh, to move it around, less weight. If we have minimal compressibility, the advantage is that our hydraulic fluid is less elastic, uh, which means that we will have basically less bounce in our system, so that if we are moving uh, a cylinder, if we are using a cylinder to push something and it is pushing back, and we have a fairly compressible, so, so say you're using a pneumatic system instead, which uses air, then you can basically push the cylinder back in because you can compress the air. So you can really get a bouncing effect on the cylinder. You won't get that uh, with hydraulic fluids because they, are, they aren't that elastic, basically. You might get a little bit, but you won't get, uh, get uh, much. The disadvantages are that uh, you can get higher pressure peaks, which means that if you get these uh, sort of bounce situations where a pneumatic cylinder would end up compressing the air and bouncing, what will happen here instead is that you will get a pressure peak, so it will uh, push on the hydraulic fluid, but it won't be able to compress it. But the pressure will, of course, increase, which means that you can get pressure peaks that are uh, fairly high uh, in, in uh, straining situations, uh, which can be a problem uh, for the system, uh, depending on how you have designed it. If you've designed it to have bypass valves, which can let uh, let the liquid, uh, let hydraulic fluid pass uh, through them if the pressure becomes too high, then you are safe because then the pressure peaks will just mean that you have uh, let some of the uh, some of the hydraulic fluid return to the tank instead of staying in the system and creating a lot of pressure. So you've, sort of, you've sort of handled a pressure peak that way. Uh, then we'll look at poor air separation characteristics there are any advantages to that and there aren't any advantages so the disadvantages if you have poor air separation characteristics in your hydraulic fluid means that you have to let it stay longer in the tank either that or you have to have a fairly large uh, area uh, in the tank so you can't have a, a, a narrow cylindrical tank which is fairly high uh, storing the fluid because you want as much surface area on your fluid as possible. So you want the fluid to have as much contact with air as you possibly can, so you want to basically make the, the tank as wide as possible so that you can, uh, can get the, the air bubbles that will be trapped inside the hydro hydraulic fluid, not exactly bubbles, but air that has been, uh, been um, diffused into the fluid, that's the word I was looking for, uh, it will end up getting the chance to diffuse back into the air while it's in the tank. So limited uh, operating temperatures. Are there any advantages to that? Nope, we don't have any advantages if we have limited operating temperatures. The disadvantage is that uh, we need to keep the temperature below 50 degrees Celsius in order to avoid water vaporization inside the liquid or inside our hydraulic fluid. More favorable viscosity temperature ra ratios. Uh, there is an advantage to HFC fluids. We get uh, less uh, kinematic viscosity difference with increased temperature differences. So the, the kinematic viscosity will change less as the temperature changes. So that's, uh, that's good uh, for the HFC fluid. The disadvantage if we have more favorable viscosity temperature ratios is for HFD fluids where we will actually get the opposite, so we will get more kinematic viscosity difference as the temperature is increased. Uh, deterioration of the hydraulic fluid. Are there any advantages to de deterioration? Of course there aren't. It means that we have to uh, change the uh, entire hydraulic fluid of the system uh, more often if it deteriorates quicker. So the disadvantages, uh, or specific disadvantages, is for HFD fluids, uh, which will also deteriorate uh, common seals and storage bladders and hoses. So they will actually deteriorate the stuff that's supposed to keep it contained inside your system. So it's, uh, when you're using HFD fluids, you will have to be, uh, pay extra attention to what, what kinds of, of uh, equipment you're using, what components you're using. 
So uh, common seals, they are often made of uh, some sort of rubber or vinyl. So you might have to go for, for uh, some other types of seals. The storage bladders, might you might have to use uh, something other than a storage bladder. You might have to use uh, uh, instead some piston type uh, uh, solution. Uh, instead of just using a bladder which can expand by itself uh, like a balloon, you have to use a mechanical uh, contraption instead. So you, you use it like a piston to uh, be allow it to expand. And instead of hoses, you can of course use pipes. Uh, so, so that's a possibility. But, but it means that it's a disadvantage because you suddenly have to take extra care when you're designing the system. And then we also have price. If we have any advantages for price, it's for the HFD fluid characteristics. So we can use HFD, uh, uh, HFD fluid characteristics will be similar to hydraulic oil characteristics if we add cooling and heating. So the, the HFD fluid is, is cheaper uh, than regular hydraulic oil, uh, but we will have to add some sort of cooling and heating to the system because it doesn't dissipate the heat as well so that we have to uh, sort of help it along the way. So putting in a radiator for cooling and uh, maybe some heating uh, somewhere in the system if we need to heat it. And disadvantages are, oh, actually was that uh, HFD fluid is actually more, more expensive than hydraulic oil, but the HFD fluid is, uh, is um, more, what was I looking for? Um, Completely, I can't find the correct word here. I just have to look it up here. Yes, uh, the HFD fluid is, of course, the um, it's one of the flame retardant ones, uh, but it's the one that's uh, completely water free. So it's the one that's uh, created by uh, from phosphate esters, that was the word I was looking for. So I remembered it started on P, but I can't <laughs> remember what it was. So, so it's more expensive than the hydraulic oil, but you can end up getting the same characteristics if you add the cooling and heating to it. Uh, yeah? What do you mean a higher pressure peaks? What, what, what was the question? It means that you will get, uh, if, if you're uh, pushing a weight uh, with a piston, for an example, uh, and if you're pushing it upwards, and then for some reason you get some movement in your system so that your weight will uh, end up pushing back down. Uh, basically, if you, if you lift it up, you lift it up and you suddenly stop with your piston, it reaches the end of, uh, end of its length then you could risk that if it's moving fast enough, you could risk that your uh, uh, weight up here will actually jump a bit. And then when it lands, it's going to uh, push back on the piston with a greater force than just its regular weight, which means that you will get a, a, a compression uh, happening there. And this will create more pressure inside your system, so more pressure than what your uh, pump is delivering into the system. So basically, you uh, it this uh, jumping motion of your weight will try to force uh, your hydraulic fluid back, but the pump is pushing it the correct way. So then you get a collision there, and you get an increase in pressure. And those pressure peaks can get fairly high, so that uh, it's important to put in uh, put in uh, bypass valves so that you can, if you do get one of these uh, uh, pressure uh, peaks then the bypass valve will quickly open and just let some of the fluid pass through it so that the, the pressure stays uh, where it's supposed to be. So, uh, so that you avoid, uh, you get less fluid inside your, inside your cylinder, but you keep the pressure at the correct, uh, correct point. Because uh, you might risk that the pressure peak becomes so high that it's going to burst some of your seals in the system so that you, you will get a leak afterwards. Now we're going to start looking at the components of the power supply section. <coughs> so in the power supply, 
uh, section, the HPU, as we uh, as they call it in the in the subsea part, and basically all of the industry calls it just HPU, so hydraulic power unit, basically. You will have to have a some sort of drive. So uh, if it's a mobile system, it will be most likely an internal combustion engine, so a, a gasoline or diesel engine that will be driving it. If it's a stationary system, it is usually an electric motor that's running it. You will need to have a pump, which is going to pump the, uh, the hydraulic fluid into your system and maintain pressure inside it. And you will need your pressure relief valve, so if the pump ends up creating too much pressure than what you uh, need at that point in your uh, system, it, the pressure relief valve will open up and return fluid to, to the uh, tank, just so that the pump doesn't raise the pressure too high. It's basically, the, the bypass valve I've been talking about with pressure peaks is basically a pressure relief valve, but it's fast acting, so, so it reacts a lot faster than a regular pressure relief valve. So it's going to open very quickly when it gets uh, too high pressure. While the pressure relief valve will uh, take a bit more time because it's, it doesn't get these very, uh, very uh, quickly happening pressure peaks. It, it's getting uh, a slowly increase of pressure coming from the pump. So it has a lot of time to react, so it's not a big problem. Yeah? Basically, Try to uh, try to draw it a bit here. Uh, one good way of envisioning it is that you have a seat, and you have basically a ball inside the seat. The ball is placed on a uh, uh, on a uh, spring, so it's spring loaded. So the spring is going to push the ball up here. And when the ball is up here, there is room for, for liquid to pass, pass uh, along the sides of it. And there's an opening here that will return, it will return the liquid to the tank. Uh, no, no, I'm drawing this uh, the wrong type, basically. Uh, wrong way around. You have the, the ball there, and then you have the The uh, spring-loaded one, uh, yeah. So this is the pressure side. So here you have pressure coming in. So when the pressure is normal, when you've got the, the correct amount of pressure, the spring load here will push the ball all the way so that it's pushing against against this seat, so it's basically sealing the opening here. And this spring is strong enough to counteract the pressure, so that it's, it is just pushing it in, uh, the ball and keeping it in place. But if we then increase the pressure so that we, uh, we get a higher pressure here, pushing against it, then the entire ball is going to be pushed against the, the spring, which allows the liquid to pass along the sides of it. So having a, a fast-acting one is basically just having having it react more quickly uh, so it depends a bit on how your how your system is this is a very very um, very simple one there are uh, a lot more complicated uh, types so this is called a check valve so it's just a it allows fluid to pass one way but fluid cannot pass the other way so if, if we get if we for some reason should uh, end up getting a lot of pressure on this side coming in here it will of course work uh, with the spring in pushing the ball valve into the seat here. So you can't get any liquid going this way, but you can have liquid going that way. So it allows you to, to basically bypass the rest of the system that is further up here. <coughs> we will be coming more into the different valves uh, as we go along, but uh, this is just the most basic, sim uh, basic uh, way of uh, letting fluid pass through a point without letting it come back the other way. You will also need uh, a coupling, and the coupling is between the drive and the pump. Uh, and it is set to 
to uh, preferably be flexible in some kind of way uh, so that it will be able to handle if the if for some reason if you're running uh, uh, if your drive is a, a a gasoline engine or a diesel engine uh, you might not be able to get it to, uh, to run at a completely constant uh, rotational speed so you might be having it fluctuating a bit 720 750 uh, rpms it's just moving a bit uh, back and forth um, uh, as the system uh, especially as the system is uh, heating up uh, which means that if it's directly connected to the pump and this is a rigid system so, so the cup if the coupling is rigid then you are going to get all of these fluctuations that you're getting in your in your drive those are going to be transferred to the pump and sort of your your pressure will be jumping up and down uh, as the pump is moving so what you want is to have something that is a little bit flexible so that when you get sort of these these uh, jerks from the uh, from the engine uh, it's going to basically be caught in the flexibility of the coupling so that the the pump will run at a more constant speed even though the even though the engine is running at a uh, sort of jerking uh, speed uh, so we'll get more into couplings in the next lecture basically um, either the next or the one after that uh, you will need a tank of course you need somewhere for the excess fluid to stay and also as we looked at with the air dissipation you need to have a tank that is designed for your system so that you can let uh, air bubbles dissipate out of the out of the fluid <coughs> and also the tank helps in cooling uh, the liquid afterwards so, so the longer the longer the uh, of the larger the tank is the longer the liquid uh, hydraulic fluid stays inside the tank before it is sucked up by the pump again and the longer it gets to cool to to uh, uh, room temperature You'll need filters because you don't want uh, you don't want to uh, be pulling around uh, around any any contaminations or particles uh, from the system. So w whenever you have uh, have mechanical components that are moving together, the the metal will scrape against metal, and you will will get small particles of metal uh, that are basically just flying off in all directions. And the only direction they can go is into the hydraulic fluid. So that is going to follow the hydraulic fluid back to the tank, and that's why you want filters uh, around the tank. So you want you want to filter the uh, the uh, uh, return fluid as it's coming back. You want to filter it to try to catch as much as you can before it ends up in the tank, and then you also want to filter it before you send it into the pump again, before you suck it up into the pump, because you really don't want you don't want a small uh, a small steel particle to go into the pump and then suddenly jamming the pump so that you are either destroying the pump or just locking it up com completely so it's really important to keep the try to keep the hydraulic fluid as clean as possible as we are going along of course there are some systems that are built to be so-called dirty systems where uh, all of the components have been built so that they can handle a lot of particles coming in B basically it means that they have a more clearing uh, so if you have a if you have a piston that is uh, supposed to be moving up and down you will have the piston here and you will have some sort of seal uh, an o-ring or something that will will seal it so that you keep the pressure on one side and then you have lower pressure on the other side uh, and basically if you are allowing for more uh, more contaminants in the systems you will let the clearing between here the distance between the piston itself and the cylinder you allow that one to become a bit bigger just so that you won't trap any of the particles inside there they're allowed to to flow in here and then they can just move around in here and then sooner or later they will move out again and they will just move around in the fluid so if you have a dirty system it is possible to run it with uh, with uh, having uh, up to a certain point of particles uh, inside it and it is done uh, especially for like the ROV systems uh, when they are using uh, detachable tools hydraulic tools where they can pick up a tool from a uh, from a basket that's been lowered down 
it, it can pick up the tool and then it can connect it to its, to its uh, hydraulic system. That hydraulic system is going to get salt water into it. So, uh, and the salt and minerals and sediments will follow this water and that will also become some of the, the dirty particles that are inside the hydraulic fluid. So then you have a separate system. So you have one system, hydraulic system, that runs these tools and it is very often serviced so that you get, you, they open it up and they check that everything is okay and they exchange seals and just check that there are not much damage inside it. And then you have uh, a separate uh, main system that is running the thrusters and everything on the ROV. So all the internal hydraulics on the ROV is being run by a separate system which runs on clean fluid. So only the, the external uh, tools that the ROV is using uh, gets this uh, dirty fluid. So that's uh, some of the points with filters. So you will also most likely need a cooler somewhere uh, be because e even though uh, e even though you design the hydraulic system as best as you can, most likely the, uh, uh, the tank itself won't be enough to cool the hydraulic fluid because it's going to gain a lot of heat as you go through the system. It depends a bit on the system, of course. Uh, if you are only operating uh, one cylinder back and forth, and it's not going fast, it's not be, uh, being done uh, with much speed or anything like that, you won't have that much flow going through your system. So basically you won't get this friction, you won't get heat created from that. Um, the system won't be working very hard, so then you would, you would uh, be fine with just using a tank. But as soon as you are connecting more stuff, and especially if you have uh, some rotating stuff in there, if you have an, a hydraulic motor that's being run by the system, you have to have a high flow rate to keep a hydraulic motor running. So then you would need uh, to add a cooler, just so that you can cool uh, the hydraulic fluid before it is returned into the tank, and then the tank will do the rest of the cooling. So you can get it cooled down to a certain point before you. And that's basically more or less like a heat pump uh, system where you use it. So, so uh, like you looked at in, in uh, thermodynamics with refrigeration and heat pumps, that's basically the same principle that is used with the coolers. And you might have heat need heaters, as I talked about a bit earlier. If, uh, if you have, have a particularly sensitive system and it's supposed to be operating at uh, 100 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius or whatever, you, it might be might be prudent to actually heat the hydraulic fluid before you start the system, just so that you, you make sure that you get the correct viscosity and everything uh, for the system as, as you are starting. Because uh, uh, like for, for, an, uh, for a car engine, it's not a problem starting from cold. It's going to make, uh, make more pollution with its exhaust, uh, and uh, it's not going to run that well, so it's going to use more uh, gasoline or diesel. Uh, as it's going, but after 10, 15 minutes, it's going to reach its operating temperature and then it's going to work fine. So, so uh, you don't really need to have these heaters, but actually some cars do have heaters, uh, especially diesel cars. They often have these uh, diesel heaters where it actually, you can set a timer on it. I have it on my car, so I can set it and put a timer on it and it will start burning some of the diesel. So it has a burner where it starts heating the diesel so it burns diesel and it starts heating the cooling liquid and the oil of the uh, engine so that the engine is more or less at operating temperature. And if it, the engine reaches its operating temperature before I start it, then it starts using the excess heat that it's generating to, uh, to uh, heat the compartments. So it's sending it into the air conditioning system, which is very nice in, on a cold winter day when you <laughs> get out there and the, and the car is all warm and nice. No snow or ice on top of it or anything. But but the the main point of it isn't really to to, to give me a nice experience as I <laughs> as I sit inside my car, but it is to to heat the engine so that the engine will have a better start, uh, so that it won't get as much wear and tear from from the cold. So here is a typical uh, uh, hydraulic power supply section, and as you can see, this is a mobile one. Uh, actually, this is one that is used to run tests on the hydraulic systems of planes. So they have these at airports. 
and then when the plane comes in, if they are going to do some servicing on it, then they will roll this one over to the plane, and then they will connect it to the hydraulic system of the plane. And it has a, I think this one has a, a gasoline engine, so you can see the gasoline engine in here, actually. There's the exhaust pipe for, uh, for the engine. And you have uh, coolers and heaters and tanks and everything in, in here. I think it is. So, yeah, there's the stainless steel fuel tank on the top there. And there's the stainless steel reservoir. So that's for the hydraulic fluid, the tank for the fluid. And there's a Perkins diesel engine. So it was diesel, it wasn't gasoline on this one. And you have this uh, all welded frame that's uh, holding everything together. You have engine controls. So you need to be able to control your engine to, uh, to put it at, uh, at the correct, uh, correct RPMs and everything uh, to run your system correctly. You have a pump flow meter, so it checks how much hydraulic fluid the pump is delivering. And you have a control valve for the pump. And you have a bypass dump valve. So basically that is uh, a manual valve bypass valve so that if you feel like uh, I'm going to do something to uh, to the system which is sort of dangerous I'm going to put my hands in where they can be uh, squeezed or cut by uh, uh, hydraulic components that are suddenly moving then I would like to instead of shutting down the entire hydraulic power supply I just open up the bypass valve because then the the pump will be sending all of its fluid uh, out of the pump and directly back into the tank. So it will just be going in a circle. But you won't need to, to shut down your diesel engine or anything. So that's a good way uh, of doing it. So you ma maintain safety for yourself and uh, you also get uh, to let the system keep on running. Then you have uh, pressure controls for the pump itself up here. Uh, and then you have a pressure gauge to keep an eye on the pressure so that you don't want to get too much pressure on in your system. And then of course you have the temperature gauge to check the, the uh, hydraulic fluid that you're using. So this is uh, used for, uh, for planes, uh, as I said. Um, and most of the uh, stuff that are moving around on the uh, plane wings, those are hydraulics. So, so all of that is run by hydraulics. So uh, instead of starting up the entire plane and keeping the plane running to check all the functions, they can just connect this one and just check the hydraulic functions instead. So that's a good way of doing it. So we'll do uh, a 15 minute break.
Right, we'll uh, continue on. This is the uh, lab, our lab here on the school. So I just went in and took a picture of it uh, just to make you a bit more familiar about it. I don't really have much to, to do with the lab that you're going to, uh, to be doing. Uh, it's Runal that's doing all of the uh, management stuff there and uh, I think there is a uh, a, uh, an outside teacher that's coming in to do it with you. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I basically don't have time to do it myself. So <laughs> if I had time, I would have done it myself because it's uh, really fun to do in the lab, but uh, I don't have time for it. Um, here we have the hydraulic power unit in our lab under here. So, uh, so uh, it's the, the, the pump and the engine. And here's our tank where we have our uh, food stored. Uh, the reason why the pump is placed uh, inside this sort of, uh, uh, not quite sure what we're going to call it, but uh, but this uh, holder that's placed in is because every now and then there is some leakage uh, from, uh, from the system. And it's just nice to make sure that it's not going to spill onto the floor and just run all over the place. So then we, uh, we catch it in this, in this uh, part here instead. So we have the tank here where uh, all of the hydraulic fluid is being stored. And there's a cooling unit up top here to cool it as it's coming back because we are running uh, a motor uh, as we're going to see uh, later on. We have an accumulator here, which is sort of, if you're going to, to, to make a comparison to anything, it's like a hydraulic battery Basically, you can <coughs> store hydraulic energy inside the accumulator, and then you can release it at a later point, which basically means that there's like a balloon inside there, and you fill up this balloon with your uh, hydraulic fluid at a certain pressure, and the balloon isn't really big to begin with, so when you've filled it up, it's going to want to, uh, want to uh, push back into its original state, so that when you've filled it up, uh, you can later on release the fluid that's inside the accumulator. Uh, it's not a big amount of fluid, but it might be enough to, to move a piston once or twice, uh, just so that you can, for an example, uh, open up something if you're, uh, if some, or maybe close something if it's, uh, if it's a really, uh, if it's really important to, to be able to do something, even though you're losing, uh, use losing your uh, power supply for it. So if you need to sort of set your system into a certain certain position before you uh, before you uh, uh, stop using it, and then there's a power outage and you don't have your pump running anymore, then you can have an accumulator that uh, has been storing the energy, and then you can use the accumulator to get the system into the correct position before you before you uh, stop using it. Uh, there are two cylinders in the system, so there's one cylinder here and one cylinder there with pistons in them, so you're going to be running them in and out uh, a couple of times, I think. Uh, and over here we have uh, mounted a hydraulic motor, so you're going to be running that one. I think you're also going to be uh, doing some readings to check uh, the rotational speed, so you're going to use a handheld uh, device that you basically just you press it into the uh, the rotating uh, rotating shaft that's uh, at the end of the hydraulic motor, and then this device will also be a rotating uh, shaft inside it, and then we'll be measuring how many how many rotations uh, per minute you are getting. Uh, and I also know that you're going to do a, uh, quite a few calculations around this, so that's why I think Runal is pushing it to uh, later in the semester, basically, so that we are going to get to the point where you can actually do the calculations uh, that you're supposed to do here, uh, which is one of the reasons why you're going to measure the, uh, if it's still like it was when I did this lab, uh, that you're going to measure the, the rotational speed of this one, because then first you're going to calculate it, what the rotational speed is going to be, and then you're going to measure it afterwards and see, is, is it the same as what you calculated, or is it less, or is it more, or wh what is it? So, sort of... Uh, a fun thing to do, to do the calculations first and then uh, actually get to check um, if they are correct or not afterwards. Uh, and over here are the directional valves for, for, 
controlling the flow of the fluid. So that was our uh, our um, lab. <laughs> now we are we have been looking at the uh, power supply. So now now we are going to look more at the power supply. For now for the drive for the power supply. So as I said a bit earlier, for stationary systems we use electric motors mainly. Of course there, there will always be, uh, be uh, other systems that are not using an electric motor, even though they are stationary, there, there is always other solutions that can be used, but uh, for the most part a stationary system will, will be using an electric motor. And for the mobile systems they will use internal combustion engines, so diesel or gasoline or maybe even a gas engine so, so that's using la natural gas. Uh, it depends a bit on the size of the system. So we're going to look a bit at this uh, figure 4.1 uh, in the uh, book and it looks really hefty. It's, uh, it's an example of, uh, of a system. Uh, we're showing it with, with the symbols instead. I've added the tank and the pump here just to uh, be able to show that also. So this is the uh, the general symbol for a for a pump. Uh, these symbols that are here, those are check valves. So they are allowing the flow uh, for for this check valve. It's allowing flow this way, and for for that check valve, it's allowing flow that way. So it's uh, they they are blocking flow in one direction, but allowing it in the other direction. And here we have another one where it's uh, uh, where it's um, uh, creating uh, it's basically throttling uh, the flow a bit there. So it's uh, well, it's not exactly throttling; it's lowering the flow rate uh, of it. Uh, here's a big component with lots of valves and stuff inside it. Uh, another directional valve. We have more more components up here, and up top is a piston that's being run. We're not going to go into details on everything here now. What we are going to be looking at is the pump and the tank and we are going to look, look at the, the general flow uh, through a system. So first off we are going to look at the common pressure lines. So once you start up the pump it's sucking uh, hydraulic fluid from the tank into the pump and then it's sending it out at a certain pressure. And this will go along this entire line and if you have more more components in your system over here that's connected then it will go to those components also. It will be going up here. Here it will be splitting going into this uh, larger component going up here to uh, this valve and it will be going over here. Here is a, a uh, manometer uh, which tells you how, ma how much pressure you have in your line. So it's going to tell you the pressure and then it will be going down here and here you have a pressure relief valve. So this one will have a uh, sort of pilot pressure here. So a very thin uh, connection to the pressure line which allows uh, just a little bit of the fluid to move in here and push on this one. And once it pushes hard enough to counteract this uh, spring over here, then the arrow will be moved over so that it it's uh, directly in line with the, the rest so that then it will move directly back to the tank. We will be looking a bit more in detail on that, that one a bit later. We also have a common return line, which is everything in red here, which means that it's, uh, this is where everything is returning to tank. And as you can see up on the valve up here, it says P for pressure and T for tank. And they are often often uh, marked this way. So P for pressure and T for tank. So just telling you which is, which is uh, supposed to be connected to the pump and which is supposed to be connected to uh, the tank. Uh, what's happening up top here, we won't go much into detail there because then we need to know what's happening inside this valve and we haven't gotten to that point yet. But here we also have, uh, you have pressure and tank there. And in this case, we have actually two two ways of sending the the uh, uh, pressure down into the tank. So you have a pressure relief valve here also. And then we 
uh, the, the pressure is sent down here and into the tank, of course. But what are these, uh, these dotted lines that are going down here? Those are the common leakage lines. So they are connected to the tank also. And because we have valves going on here, uh, there will be leakage from them. So there will be some trickle of hydraulic fluid that will be uh, able to slip past all of the seals that we have. And it will be dripping out, uh, basically, uh, in, in a specific uh, connection. So, so the, the, the valves have been made in such a way that you can drain this leaking fluid from uh, one specific hole. So you connect your hose to this hole, and the small drips that are coming of leakage oil will enter your hose, and they will go back to your tank. So it's not like, it's not like there's a huge flow of of, uh, of uh, hydraulic fluid going through these green lines. It's just a little bit uh, as you are uh, operating a system. So it might be, it might be ev anything from just a few drops to just a small trickle that's uh, coming. So, so it's, uh, it can be, uh, can be quite little. And, and if you're really lucky, your system is uh, completely sealed so that you don't get any leakage at all. But it is important to sort of catch it because if you don't have anywhere to, to send this, uh, leakage oil, it will go into the system here and then, and then it will start uh, blocking up the system. If you fill up this part of the valve uh, with hydraulic leakage fluid, then uh, after a point the valve isn't going to work because then you have incompressible fluid that's filling up a void there where it's supposed to be, there's supposed to be uh, opening here. Uh, so then you release it back to your tank instead. <coughs> So the next thing we're going to look at is the pump itself. And for the pump, the basic function of the pump is to uh, convert the mechanical energy of the power unit into hydraulic or pressure energy. So, so for uh, uh, Young me as a mechanic would always call it hydraulic energy, but uh, engineering and physics me calls it pressure energy. So it's, <laughs> it's just a matter of viewpoints here. So you have external and internal resistance in the, uh, uh, in the system, and you have volumetric flow rate. And this leads into having uh, uh, pressure. So the volumetric flow rate is delivered by the pump itself. And then you will have external and internal resistances that will uh, also attribute to the pressure. Because like we were looking at the, uh, the uh, hydraulic power supply that they use for planes, they have this manual bypass valve. If you engage that one and you let the pump just pump the fluid directly back into the tank, it's just going in a circle. It basically doesn't have anything pushing back on it. So it doesn't have any pressure because it only has volumetric flow rate. It doesn't have external and internal resistance. It will have some internal resistance, of course, because it has friction uh, of the fluid as it's moving through the pipes or, or hoses. But it will be so small that most likely your pressure gauge, your manometer, won't be able to, to actually see it. So, so it won't even be, be twitching uh, at all. Uh, so but when you suddenly start to, to connect it to the plane and you're starting to move the flaps of the wings and everything, then, then you will see that you have a lot of pressure because then you are putting a lot of external resistance into the system. So examples of uh, external resistance is the effective load. So that if you have a piston moving and it's uh, pushing or lifting or, or whatever on, on something that weighs uh, something, then you have an effective load. So long as you're moving around on something more than the hydraulic components themselves, then you have the effective load there. You will also have the mechanical friction. So if you are uh, moving, uh, for example, the flaps on the plane wing, if you're moving those further out, there are pistons that are moving them and they are just pushing on them, but you will have uh, mechanical friction on the flaps themselves as they are being slid out so that you will will end up with uh, more friction than what is inside the hydraulic system. 
We also have static loads, which is just basic weight of the systems, uh, of, of the external parts of the system. So anything you just place on it is static loads. Acceleration is, of course, uh, an external uh, load or a resistance. So the, the faster you need your system to react and accelerate, then the more, the more resistance you're going to get. And then internal resistance. You have the overall hydraulic friction inside the fluid. That's going to, to add, add to the pressure. You have the viscous friction uh, of it. And then, of course, you have the throttle points, which, uh, uh, which uh, we saw last time uh, create uh, pressure drops in the system. Um, but still, before reaching the throttle point, you will have a certain pressure. And that's the resistance you get as you, uh, you, you end up pushing it through the throttle point. Because of this, we use the pressure relief valves. We, we don't want the, the pressure to, to get too much. As I've been talking about earlier, we don't want to, to accidentally destroy components in the hydraulic system because we are getting too high pressure. And now we're going to look a bit back on the figure 4.1. So we're going to look at the, the pressure relief valve. So when we have pressure coming in here, it's going into the system, it's going up to the uh, pressure gauge, and we have pressure push pushing on this valve. If we now increase our pressure a bit, so there becomes more pressure inside our system. It's now too much. The uh, uh, pressure gauge is uh, pointing uh, too high. Then this arrow becomes uh, moves over into the correct position. So this is actual mechanical components inside the valve that are being pushed into the correct position. So it's not just an arrow uh, on the symbol. It's actually uh, it's opening up uh, flow to to be uh, allow uh, allow the flow through there. So then we get. Uh, a return line here, so we are returning some of the fluid, which means that we return to the original pressure that we were supposed to have in, in the system. So we, in, and as soon as we return to the original pressure, this uh, uh, this spring will make sure that we it pushes the the valve back so that it stops uh, releasing fluid back into the tank. We're looking at uh, displacement volume. Which is one of the, uh, one of the uh, characteristics, uh, characteristic values uh, that are important for a pump. And it is also known as the del delivery rate or the pump capacity, basically. And it just means that uh, it's, it's a measure of the pump size. So if you have a rotating pump, it means that the displacement volume is the volume of fluid that it's going to uh, going to pass through the pump for every rotation. So it's actually, even though we're not writing it, I think I actually have it on on here. So so we use the flow rate, we use the rotational speed, and we use the displacement volume. So I'm just going to do an example, and I think I've shown it pretty well here. We're going to look at the gear pump. You're going to know later what a gear pump is. I'm going to show you in detail. If we have a rotational speed of 1,450 RPMs, and we have a displacement volume of 2.8 cubic centimeters, Then these RPMs, they are, of course, revolutions per minute, so amount of revolutions per minute. And even though it's not written anywhere here, it's cubic centimeters per revolution. So when we put these together, we're going to get, um, because, of course, a, a revolution, it doesn't have any units per se. So this is, if you're going to write this correctly, you would write it as, N equals 1,450 minutes raised to the minus 1, or 
could also write one divided by minute. So that, that's the, the correct one, uh, which is also why that doesn't it doesn't say anything about per revolution on the on the displacement volume. But that is in effect what we are calculating here. So we set up the the uh, um, uh, flow equation. So we have our 1,450 per minute multiplied with our 2.8 uh, cubic centimeters. This gives us 4,060 cubic centimeters per minute. Of cubic centimeters, that's not a good thing to, to, to work on. That is usually what uh, displacement volumes are given in and often what uh, general volumes are given in, in uh, hydraulics. But usually when we're talking about flow, we want to know amount of liters per minute. So what we do is we convert it from cubic centimeters to cubic decimeters. And of course, since it's cubic, we have uh, a, a decimeter is you have 10 centimeters inside one decimeter. But since it's cubic, you have to do it to the power of three. So 10 to the power of three, that is, of course, a thousand. And since we are going from the small unit to the big unit, we have to divide by a thousand. So we get 4.06 instead of 4060. And a des cubic decimeter is exactly the same as a liter. So then we get liter per minute for this one. So that's uh, one of the, the usual problems you, you run across when you're doing calculations in hydraulics is, is just the units, getting it to, to, uh, to look like something that you want it to look like, which is sad to say often a problem in most of uh, physics. <laughs> it's just getting the units right. So we're going to continue on with the pump and look at another um, another important uh, characteristic value, which is the operating pressure. And for for a pump, you will often have uh, a graph looking like this which is uh, telling you something about the startup operating pressure. So here, the, the pump isn't working. Here, you're not, you haven't started up your pump. And then when you start it up, you're getting a pressure peak all the way up to P3. And then you, uh, that's exactly when you're starting it. And then you're running at a fairly high pressure to begin with. And then you're dropping down to, to an operational pressure. So we're going to look a bit at this. So this one that's shown here is one duty cycle. So it's basically one one uh, revolution, if I'm not, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, so that's one, one revolution. So the for the first revolution, you get a sudden spike of pressure, and then it uh, keeps adding fairly high pressure for the first revolution. So that's the peak pressure we're looking at. So that's the one that we want to avoid later on in the system. So we don't want peak pressures. And this is the maximum operating pressure of the uh, pump. So this is basically when it's sort of still in the, uh, in the startup phase. It's still starting up, so it's working at its maximum pressure. And then we get to the continuous pressure, which is the operational pressure. So this is the pressure it wants to be at when, it, when it's working. So that's what it's designed to be at. So, And as you can see, the pressure isn't really, it's not a straight line. You will always get these jagged curves when you're looking at the pressures. It will always be going a bit up and down because it depends a bit on, uh, on the resistance of the system. And in order to, to avoid this pressure peak and the uh, maximum pressure possibly also the maximum pressure doing any harm to the rest of the system, we use pressure relief valves. So that, uh, for an example, if you have a pump, uh, it's not always that your pump is going to be exactly uh, fitting for your design. So you might have to use a more, a stronger pump, basically, uh, for your design. Because often uh, operational pressure and uh, flow, uh, the amount of flow 
that the pump can deliver is often uh, fairly uh, connected. So that if you, if you for some reason need a very high flow rate, you sometimes also get a very high operating pressure uh, from the pumps. Of course, it depends a bit on which pump you're looking at. But then it will be nice to use, if for, an, if for an example, you have a maximum pressure of 200 bars on your pump and an operational pressure of 175. But then you have some components that uh, really shouldn't be uh, exposed to more than 180. So they should be just at the continuous pressure at all times. That, that will be fine. They will do fine as long as they're on the continuous pressure, but they shouldn't really be exposed to the maximum pressure and certainly not the peak pressure. So what you do then is that you put in the pressure relief valves and you will put one in that will react at, for an example, 180 then. If this is supposed to be 175 here, the pressure relief valve will react at 180, so then it will send, uh, send some of the fluid back to the tank as soon as it hits 180. So that's a good way of, of uh, sort of uh, protecting the components in your system. Because sometimes you have to put that one component in your system which really can handle a lot of pressure. And then you have to protect it with, with these kinds of valves. <coughs> then we're going to look at input speed. So the volumetric flow rate depends on the rotational speed, which is the input speed. So most commonly, we use somewhere around 1500 RPMs, which is a very, uh, very easy, easy speed to attain with an electric motor. Uh, for an internal combustion engine, it usually means that you have to, uh, you have to use the, uh, the gas pedal a bit on it, because usually on internal combustion engines, when they are idling, so going without any resistance, they are idling around 750 to 1000 RPMs, it's a bit dependent on the on the motor or the engine. So usually you have to give it, uh, give it a little bit of uh, gas in order to, to, to uh, keep it at around 1500, which, which is also why you will get these fluctuations where it will, will be uh, sort of having this jagged line of rotation speed where it, it can't keep it exactly at a certain, a certain uh, uh, RPM. So it will be fluctuating a bit as it goes along. So look a bit at efficiency. So we have several kinds of efficiencies to look at. I think uh, Runal has talked a bit about efficiencies with you. So we have the volumetric efficiency and we have uh, hydraulic mechanical efficiency. And if we combine those, we will get a total efficiency. So the, the volumetric efficiency is basically just the efficiency of the pump, how much can it deliver? Is it actually delivering what it's uh, theoretically supposed to deliver? Most likely not, because it's going to have leakage oil somewhere. It's going to leak some of the oil uh, back, to, uh, back to the tank, uh, most likely. So that uh, it won't be able to run at 100% efficiency. It will usually be somewhere between 85 and uh, 91, 92. Depending on the uh, depending on the pump, but it won't be a hundred percent. So you have to take that into account, and you also have to take into account the hydraulic mechanical efficiency, which is just based on the friction uh, and everything that can can go wrong and and sort of slow down your system outside the 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 hydraulic system itself. <coughs> so uh, in order to to do calculations on efficiencies. Uh, we often utilize characteristic curves. So they look at the volumetric flow rate and the power usage and the efficiency then. So if we're going to look at a characteristic pump curve, a QP, which is the uh, Q for volumetric flow rate and P for pressure, it will look at the actual volumetric flow rate, QW, and then it also takes the pump leakage, QL, into account. So L for leakage. And this, this leakage oil, it is completely necessary in order to lubricate the system. So, so you can't, 
you can't really create any uh, hydraulic pump without having any leakage in it. So, so it, it is uh, actually impossible to get 100% volumetric efficiency out of a pump because you really do need that lubrication. Possibly you could create uh, an extravagant pump with uh, some sort of external lubrication, uh, but, but that would be, uh, would be easier to just take the efficiency into account <laughs> when, when you are uh, choosing your pump. So we're going to look at a characteristic pump curve. So as you can see, as you can see from it, um, we have the first one here on top is a, a completely new pump, and the second is a used pump. So you can see we actually almost have a, a doubling in in uh, amount of amount of percentage we lose here. So it's it's going to be this is sort of the reverse of the efficiency. The efficiency for for this new pump would be uh, 94, and for this other one it would be would be 87. So that you have, uh, you have, you're, you're looking at the loss instead of looking at the, the efficiency of the pump itself on this one. So as you can see, you, you have the, the pressure on the low one here. It's given in megapascals instead of bars. I'll give you a quick tip here uh, before we continue on. The easiest way of doing conversions between pascal and bar is just to remember that Ten bars equals one megapascal. This will this will actually come in handy in mechanical design also, <coughs> because sometimes you are you are uh, calculating uh, the the stress caused by uh, pressure inside a unit. So, for example, if you are if you are calculating on uh, on a pressurized tank, so you're cal calculating the wall thickness. And the, uh, and the internal stress in the material. You want stress to be in megapascals, but you are given a pressure in bar that are inside. Then you will very easily just convert it to megapascal. You don't have to do, do any, uh, any calculations in order to convert it because you know that 10 bar is 1 megapascal, which means that 1 bar will be 0 0.1 megapascal. So it's the, uh, a very easy and simple conversion to do. So I would uh, remind all of you to try to, uh, to memorize that one. So when, when the pressure here is at zero, we have full volumetric flow rate. So then we are all the way up at 10 uh, on this pump. A and but as our pressure increases, the volumetric flow ra rate becomes less due to this leakage oil that we are getting. Because basically, uh, the, the more resistance we get in the, si uh, in the system, which is basically uh, how much pressure we, ha we have in the system. So the more resistance it has, the more it needs to lubricate itself in the pump. So it, it sort of uh, works naturally uh, that way, that the, the leakage increases with pressure. And this will give us, uh, these curves gives us quite a lot of information about the volumetric efficiency of, the, uh, of a pump. And it makes it possible for us to do, do calculations. So now we're going to look, look at the, the new pump in this one. So for the new pump, at zero, we're supposed to have 10 liters per minute or cubic decimeters per minute. At 230 bars, we're supposed to have 9.4 liters per minute. And that's what we have here because... Uh, 230 bars will be 23 megapascals, so the, that's this line. And we can see up here, if we go along here, we end up at around yeah, 9.4. I'm a bit, a bit off when I'm uh, standing over on the side here. Which means that we have a leakage of 0 0.6 liters per minute. So we have 9.4 that's being delivered to the system, and we are leaking 0 0.6 liters per minute. And if we want to know our 
uh, volumetric efficiency. We just do the, the actual um, flow rate and we divide it by the, the optimum, which is when it has zero pressure flowing. And then we get the 94%. And we see that 94% plus 6%, then we are up at 100. Now we look at the used pump. So the used pump was also supposed to deliver 10 liters per minute uh, at, the, uh, uh, at zero pressure. And if we get 230 in pressure, 23 megapascal on this line, when we are at this point, we go over and see we are approximately 8.7 there. It's a bit easier when you have it in your book where you can uh, put a ruler across and just uh, see where you're hitting. Which means that 10 minus 8.7, that gives us 1.3 uh, in leakage. So again, we do the the actual volumetric flow rate divided by the optimum, and then we get 87% for this one, which fits with 87% plus 13, then we get up to up to 100. So today we were supposed to become familiar with viscosity limits. So we looked at these uh, viscosity pressure and viscosity temperature ratios. Uh, yeah, that's the viscosity pressure ratio we looked at. We were supposed to become familiar with the drive of a hydraulic power supply and become familiar with the pump of a hydraulic power supply. So we looked at, at the pump also in it. We're supposed to learn about the term displacement volume and we're going to be able to calculate flow from displacement volume and rotational speed which is a very, very simple calculation, so it shouldn't be a problem. We were to become familiar with the terms of operating pressure, input speed, efficiency, and characteristic pump curves. So we just looked at the characteristic pump curves. And then we were going to be able to calculate efficiencies from these curves, which basically just means getting your information from points in the graph. So it's fairly easy to do. I didn't really have many uh, references in this one. It was the textbook and uh, the diesel hydraulic power unit. Yes, then we're done for today. We'll continue on on Friday.